Welcome back, part five, talking all about COVID. Um, so let me tell you the first thing. Um, teachers are asking what this is going to look like in the fall. Um, our district is supposed to come out with information tonight, like the board meeting is happening tonight as I speak. Um, so my plan for you guys, first of all, is that when I come up with a plan of attack, I will share that with you. So I will make another video or whatever, and I will share with you any thoughts or feedback I have on that. Because right now, um, I don't have an answer for what it's exactly going to look like. I will tell you this. Um, I am a worrier. I worry a ton. I think a lot. My brain doesn't shut off. I'm sure you're off in the same way. Um, and so I've been having like major ups and downs all the time about this situation. So um, I will talk to you a little bit about what happened when we had the shutdown. And then, but I wanted to tell you about kind of right now. Okay. So I apologize that this has taken me so long to get feedback to you. I went out of town. Um, so I live in the Western suburbs of Chicago and, um, our space between houses is pretty small and my kids have an autoimmune disorder and my husband is immunocompromised. And so we have been like mega social distance and very cautious um, of all of this. And our anxiety, like one day we're totally fine and everything's fine. And the next day we're all like an ink ball of angst, right? <laughs> or anxiousness. Um, and so I needed to take some time actually to um, like stop <laughs> for a little bit. I, um, my in-laws live down in Tennessee near the Smoky Mountains. They actually are in a very remote area. And I was very concerned about having to travel down there to visit them um, because I know the numbers are going up, up, up there. And we've been so cautious. I was very, very nervous. But um, my family, we decided to take that week, um, actually 10 days, and go down to them. And they live in a very remote area. So like internet's very slow. Um, so that's why it took me so long to get this back to you. But they, um, I went hiking almost every single day. And when I was hiking, I was in the best place that I could be. And I was taking the time because I knew that no decisions from our district would be made until the 13th today. Um, and so I keep hearing this and it's hard to remind ourselves, but we have to control, control what we can control, right? And the things we can't control, we have to let go. And I still watch the news or Twitter or whatever. And I am on a daily basis, just like really worried, right? About everything, right? Um, so when people asked me at the webinar, like, you know, what's this going to look like in COVID? Are you going to talk about this in COVID? Like, I couldn't because I, I put a pause on thinking about it because I, our district is coming up with three different plans, like a lot of districts are, right? A fully in-class, a, a hybrid, and a fully remote. And I couldn't sit there and hypothesize and plan and plan and plan for something that may or may not happen. Um, instead, I wanted to take this time to be with my family, to um, get grounded so that I could come back to addressing these situations um, with a clearer and more level head instead of being stressed and anxious all the time. So, um, so I know you want answers. So what I'm going to tell you is I'm happy to share them once I figure them out myself. So we're in the same boat. You're not alone. Doesn't that feel like bad and good at the same time? <laughs> um, so that's my comment about that. Okay. All right. So going back to, um, Oh, to, to, to finish that off, I guess I will say, a lot of questions were like, do you think that this can happen vi virtually? Um, I don't know how this is going to happen with social distancing in the classroom. I um, don't know how to organize this. So I don't have any of those answers, but I will say I do envision that it will work virtually. Um, I think that giving our students choice is going to help connect us on a deeper level. Um, when we are not with them physically. I think that 
you have to be careful about how you level uh, offer those choices. And a question earlier came up that I kind of tabled was, what does choice boards look like? So I'm going to show you a little bit about um, what it looked like for me in my classroom when we went to the shutdown. So I will show that for you in a few minutes. I'll like um, flip my screen so you can see. Um, but basically when the shutdown happened, and I think I addressed this in the webinar, but when the shutdown happened, I wanted to go back to what is it that um, was important in my classroom. And I did that NAEA 20, the virtual conference, you can access that on that handout. Um, but it's, and that's a recording of me talking about it. But basically I wanted to go back to um, creating art in for creativity and making sure my students felt in, excited about engaging in my classroom. Um, but I couldn't give them too much choice in the beginning. So a lot of teachers were like, oh, I'm going to give all these choice boards and it's going to be awesome. And then students were like, I don't know what to do. And I have to do all of these. And they didn't really understand the concept. So I really waited until, um, the second half of the shutdown, I guess. So like maybe the last month and a half, um, to provide choice boards. I asked my students what they wanted. If they wanted choice boards, they said they were ready for that. I gave all of my classes the same choice boards. So within the choice boards, um, they had different options to choose from that. So some students needed to focus on self-care. So they had a choice board of that that had a bunch of different options in there. Some had wanted to give back to the community. So I gave artistic ways to give back to the community. Um, different um, students wanted to continue to focus on their composition and photography. I gave choice, choices for that. Um, some wanted to do more crafting, like, um, and I mean, not crafting like Pinterest, I mean crafting like, like the arts and crafts movement, right? So I gave them more, they needed more like rote, like not like mindfulness type artworks. So I gave them like weaving or paper jewelry or things like that. Um, so, and that's not, that's AP aside because that's a whole nother ball of wax, right? But um, those classes needed that. So I wanted to give them those options. And I felt that um, at that point, it was most important that my students were creating and not sitting on their Chromebooks all the time, that they might have been connecting with their housemates, their, you know, um, families, uh, connecting with their community somehow um, to feel like they were making a difference, not feeling so helpless in the situation. Um, those were the goals, right? At that point, it wasn't about soldering metal together and how to make that happen. Like that's just not going to happen. So we have to stop perseverating over what could have been, how to reinvent our classrooms, but instead, or like how to repackage them, instead have to rethink about how we are reinventing them. So come fall, I know um, I'm working on an article for Art of Ed right now about this exact same thing. Um, and then I know that, like I said, I'll be happy to do another video where I talk about this, but it's the same idea. Like you can't just take what happened in your classroom and repackage it for virtual because that's just not the same. You wouldn't do that from day one. Why would you do it when you shut down? So um, we have to kind of be prepared for what that looks like. And in art, we have the unique ability to really address um trauma and needs, emotional needs through artwork and through showing mindfulness practices that are through artwork and not just like doodling, for example, not just, I mean, you can doodle, right? But there's other ways to use that to create and push. Um, and we need to give students opportunities to um, share their voice. So maybe a choice board that is focused on, you know, um, your daily COVID situation, maybe a choice board that's talked about um, Black Lives Matter or other pressing issues that students are grappling with. Um, they don't have to. I like that, that they don't have to do that because sometimes that's too much. Um, when I'm creating, sometimes that's too much for me is to say like, this is what I'm going to do. Sometimes I need to just weave for a little bit, you know, <laughs> or just do watercolor uh, through observation and not do a watercolor that's about Black Lives Matter, you know, for example, and, and maybe I'll get to that. Maybe it'll help me get to that, which I say specifically because it did, right? I was like watercoloring um, the spring flowers that were popping up and I was being mindful in that. And then that led me to be able to integrate into something more meaningful for me to process. Um, so that's kind of that, um, addressing that. So 
as far as like what is it going to look like in the classroom, social distancing, I don't really have answers for that. Um, I'm really thinking about it myself. So I, again, I will be happy to share what about a hybrid virtual model. I think that might be where our district is going. So I'm concerned about that too. I'm concerned about having to, um, on, a, on a safety level, I'm concerned about being exposed to all those students still just in smaller groups. I'm still going to be exposed to all of them. I'm concerned about what are they going to do at home versus at school. I'm concerned about having to do double the workload because you're teaching basically like almost like two classes at once. Um, the best security that I feel like I can have in a hybrid situation is that I have all of that um, front-loaded instruction like I shared with you, right, on my Canvas. And so students should, I think, in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking that at home they'll do all that front-loaded instruction, the videos, the planning, the whatever, so that when we're in class, that precious class time will be in the creating mode and learning techniques and practicing and stuff like that. That's what I'm thinking. I think our curriculum is going to have to shrink. It's not going to be as robust as it was. It won't be, students won't be able to create as much as you want them to. You'll have to scale down on the size of the assignments. You'll have to scale down on expectations of the assignments because you're not going to be there to give them that constant feedback. Um, that's what happened to me at the shutdown. I reminded myself that you know, students might have been drawing something on a napkin, and I have to say that's the best that they can do. I can't assume the worst. I can't assume like, oh, they're just being lazy or, man, they just don't want to do it. I can't assume that. I have to assume that they're struggling um, emotionally, that they're struggling maybe financially, that they're struggling with their house situation. Maybe it's just hard. Um, that's the best I can do is always assume the best for my students because, again, like I said before, I assume that my students are always wanting to learn. I assume that that is what humans want, is to learn. Um, let's see if there's any other specific questions I can answer in that. How are you thinking we'll address these workstations, um, shared materials? I, I don't know. Um, I think that kind of answers this. I think, um, oh, I'm having a hard time visualizing how stations and pure demos might work in August when we are required to maintain social distancing, safe use of materials. Yeah, I am too. I don't know. Um, I will make a video. I promise you. I will make a video and I will put it on here when I wrap my head. I've tried not to be thinking about it, but now that today the news will come out about my school, I'm ready. I'm ready to tackle it. Okay? And I'll do it with you. Okay? And you guys will probably have great ideas too. Um, okay, so that is kind of my spiel about COVID and taking care of yourself so that you can move forward and remember to not get stuck, um, that this will all work out. You know, if, if students are not getting their full curriculum in art, we're lucky that we don't have to put up with standardized tests. So do what's best for your students. Do what's best for their needs. Help them um, handle and manage everything that's going on. Give them a break. Um, connect with them through your art. Maybe you should be creating too and share that with them. That would be a suggestion um, to help your mindfulness. Maybe you start doing some morning pages and then share that with them. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have all the answers, <laughs> um, but hopefully that helps. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to show you in my next video a little bit about um, my demo for Canvas. I want to show you what my Canvas actually is set up like. So that helps you kind of understand where I'm coming from, from all of this, when it comes to remote, when it comes to in the classroom, whatever it is. Okay. Thanks for putting up with me. Here we go.